Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the College Football Playbook Podcast. I'm Mark Givler. Got Tyler Shoemaker with me, the the T-Shoe Index, uh, a, a great reference uh, for power ratings, um, a great resource if, if you like to bet on, on college football, both, you know, season win totals, point spreads, all sorts of, you know, strength of schedule metrics, all sorts of things. Um, check him out. It's at T-Shoe Index on Twitter. He posts a lot of his stuff there. And uh, we're going to be uh, doing some cool stuff here uh, with him this season. And we're excited to announce some of this here in the next week or two. But, um, you know, so look forward to that. But um, glad to have you on here again, Tyler. We're going to be talking about the Pac-12. Uh, we just did the Big Ten. We're on to the Pac-12 now. Um, is this the last year the Pac-12 is going to be a, a Power 5 conference? I guess we'll start there. It, it's uh, it's not looking good right now for the Pac-12 um, in terms of the, its long-term outlook. It is not looking good. Uh, the proposed media deal details are starting to leak. Sounds pretty shaky at best. Uh, a lot of streaming, a lot of incentive stuff. You know, not. I think I think the, the bottom line number I saw was like twenty million dollars per school, which is just not even close to what the Big Ten and SEC are doing. So, not looking good. Uh, I did kind of put out a call for questions. I did have someone ask me, you know, if I could add four teams to the to the Big Ten, who would it be? And I, I would poach straight from. I mean, get get who's vulnerable and that's the pac 12. I, I would go scoop up Oregon and Washington right now. And, you know, the big 10 being about their academics, I would probably assume that Stanford and Cal come along as well. And I, I think that that would round out uh, a, a 20 team, big, big 10 pretty nicely. It'll be interesting to see how this next round goes. Um, obviously Colorado is uh, off to the big 12. It would certainly seem like the big 12 has got a real chance to pull in maybe like Arizona, Arizona state, and maybe even like a Utah or someone like that, or maybe even Oregon and Washington. Who knows? All of a sudden, Oregon and Washington might be uh, hot commodities um, as this uh, continues to kind of fall apart here. Um, I'm with you on the streaming, and you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying this to to trash, you know, West Coasters, but Pac-12 fans don't watch football on TV the way Big Ten and SEC fans do. It's right. nice year round out there. It's like 80 degrees every day. Like people go outside and do things. Maybe they catch the score later. Maybe they catch the highlights later. Maybe they record it and watch it later, but no one is getting up and just being glued to their TV. I, I would argue the biggest football fans out in California are like Michigan, Ohio state, like transplants, <laughs> like, yep. like alumni just move out there for the wet. Like the actual people live out there. They're like on the beach, they're playing volleyball. They're, you know, skateboard, whatever they're doing. They're riding bike. They're enjoying nature. Like it's, it's just not conducive to a great TV deal. And in this, in this day and age with the money that's being thrown around, I don't know how you compete with other conferences uh, with, you know, the big 10, the sec, and even, even like the ACC at $20 million a year, I have no idea how you remain competitive. And um, here's the shame of it is we'll get into the actual topic at hand today, which is a PAC 12 preview. Here's the shame of it. I think the Pac-12 is really good this year. <laughs> That's the yeah, shame. Yeah. I think they've had they've had so many years of kind of being a one or two team league, where like USC was up and like USC and Oregon were up, and then it's like USC and Stanford were up, and you know Stanford fell off, USC fell off. Now USC's back, and it's just it's been a league that has just not been able to put together a year where there's been like five or six really good teams, and they did that a little bit last year, and there I think they're. I think they're really strong this year. I think it's the maybe the best version of the Pac-12 we've seen in a very long time, and it's it's actually yeah, it's it's a little uh, it's unfortunate that it's this is probably the last year it's going to look like this uh, for that league. But um, sure enough, like in your ratings seem to bear it out pretty well too. You've got five teams there that are what above that ten point line, so that means what five teams in the conference that would be favored by 10 points or more against an average FBS opponent. If I, if I understand your formula correctly, right? Yep. Yeah, then that's right. And five, five teams with a, with a double digit power rating. I mean, that's, that's excellent. And I mean, I've got six, you know, you throw UCLA in there, I've got six teams projected to win eight games this year. So, I mean, very strong conference. I mean, the, the bottom of the conference is pretty bad. Um, you know, similar to, to how the Big Ten is with like a Northwestern and Indiana and Rutgers. You know, the Pac-12 has Cal, Colorado, and Stanford. But 
the, I mean, the top and middle of, of the Pac-12 are going to be awesome this year. It's going to be really fun. I can't wait for Pac-12 after dark, you know, staying up till one or two in the morning Eastern time to, to watch some of these games because they're going to be electric. I loved watching the Pac-12 last year. I'm going to love it even more this year, I think. I, um, I, I think USC is obviously a playoff contender. They've got to get their defense together. Will that happen to be determined? But, um, you know, Caleb Williams is – maybe the most fun player to watch in college football. Um, you know, they've got some, some good athletes around him. Uh, it's a great story to see if he can win another Heisman. Um, there, there's a lot to like about, you know, USC's trajectory and, and uh, just what they might look like this year. I, you know, I, I, I mentioned Iowa is kind of like my, I won Penn state, I guess Penn state, but Penn state's not really a true dark horse, I guess, but I won Penn state. I felt were, um, kind of programs that we're going to be on the rise this year, maybe programs to watch this year as, as dark horse uh, division title contenders. I think Washington is that team for me this year. Um, you've got them fourth by a hair behind Utah, um, but, but still very strong. I think in the grand scheme of things um, with that power rating um, let's start there. Am I crazy to think Washington's a dark horse pack 12 title contender? No, and and I don't I don't think you're alone in in thinking that. I mean, they return. You know, they're in year two of Kalen DeBoer, who, you know, and that's that is a coach that I strongly, you know, took into consideration when coming up with their preseason power rating because, you know, it's hard. I can't just look at how Washington's been the last three or four years because you know they've got a new coach. So I did give them a lot of benefit of the doubt with their rating because of Kalen DeBoer and what he was able to do in year one. You return Michael Penix, you know, having the the coach and quarterback returning is huge. I think they've got a great receiving core. Uh, I, I know their their coaches um, lobbying for for them to be considered the the top receiving core in the in the country. I don't know. I think Ohio State and Texas might have something to say about that, but I mean, their offense projects to be awesome. Uh, about thirteen points above FBS average, and even the defense, I've got about two and a half points above. FBS average. So, you know, it's not, it's not going to be a terrible defense. I don't think. And if they can go from not terrible to, you know, pretty good, you know, kind of a similar conversation you might have about like an Ohio state last year, kind of, kind of the same boat. If the defense cannot hold them back, I think, I think they absolutely could compete to, to win the PAC 12. Yeah. I mean, taking Ohio state out of the equation right now for the receivers, if you could take any receiving core in the country, but you weren't allowed to take Ohio State's, I would take Washington's. Even over Texas, I think, as long as we're talking about – now, if you throw in the tight ends with – if you count the tight ends with Jatavian Sanders of Texas, maybe that makes it a little bit more interesting for me. But um, Roma Dunze and, and Jalen McMillan's an unbelievable uh, receiver tandem that I think most years would be the, the kind of the consensus number one team, uh, tandem. But Marvin Harrison Jr. exists, so uh, that uh, – plus a mecca book is pretty good too. But um, – you know, that kind of tilts it toward Ohio State. But I think Washington's receivers are excellent. You've got a good, experienced quarterback. You've got one of the few teams in the Pac-12 that has a true home field advantage, too. That's that's a that is that is a loud stadium. They People care about that team. You're not going to the Rose Bowl to play UCLA, you know, in front of, you know, 20,000 people in a, you know, 80, 90,000 seat stadium. Like, it, it's a legit home field advantage. Um and like you said it, Kalen DeBoer's a stud. Um, he's a great coach. I I really like Washington this year. I think they're a dark horse Pac-12 title contender. And I think they're a dark because because I think the three, like I think the three and four spots in the playoff are so wide open heading into the season. I think you can pencil in Georgia and you can pencil in like the Big Ten winner, whether that's Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, whoever. You can pencil them in for the two spot. And then for me, there's like eight teams after that that could that could take yep. those third and fourth spots where usually for me it's like there's five or six teams that can make the playoff. This year I think it's closer to like a dozen. Yep. Um, and I think Washington's one of those teams. Yep, absolutely. I, I will, to play devil's advocate on the, the other side here, they do have the second most difficult schedule in the Pac-12. Um, so for that reason, I've only got them projected at eight and a half wins um, the, the only team in the, in the Pac-12 that plays a more difficult schedule than them is Colorado, and that's mostly just because Washington can't play themselves. So, you know, keep keep that in mind, too, as you kind of form your um, opinion about what their season might look like. But 
from a talent standpoint, from a ceiling standpoint, I think they absolutely can can contend here. Let's talk about Colorado. What a fun offseason that's been. Coach Prime. And now they're going to be off to the Big 12. Um, you've got them super low. Let me throw that graphic back up for everybody. Um, you've got them, what, second to last there? Essentially yep. a 10-point dog to, add to, the, to an average FBS team. Um, what's the... What's their over under win total this year? It's like it's, it's three and a half, and I've got them, got them at two, two point four. Yeah, yeah. And that's I've actually got... one of your stronger underplays, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, or, or one of the stronger underplays uh, according to your metrics. I'm not saying you've necessarily taken that, but yeah. But there aren't a lot of metric. There aren't a lot of teams I think that are a full game be- or more below or above their over under. So right. I think that's one of your stronger plays according to your your metric. Yep. And, and like I said, it's a, it's a combination of, I don't project the team to be very good because while I do think Deion Sanders is, is going to get them going in the right direction, you know, I, I think they can't, I think they'll be better than last year because last year they were just absolutely atrocious. I do think they can be better. You know, he's going to upgrade the talent in year one for sure. But like I said, they have the most difficult schedule in the PAC 12. So you, you put those two factors together and that lends itself to an under, even on a low season win total like three and a half. And they're one of the few. This is and I don't, look. We can go around all day as to what this actually means and if it's worth a win or two or a loss or two. I don't know, but just from like a an intangible perspective, how many teams that are basically pegged to go two and ten, three and nine have a target on their back every year? Usually zero. But this one does. Everyone's going to want to beat Deion Sanders. No one's going to want to let him get any momentum, even if they're going to be in their same conference with him or not in the future. There's a lot of people who don't want him to succeed. And um, I, th- that's not going to be your typical, oh, terrible Colorado. We can sleepwalk this week. It's it's not going to be possible with the target kind of Deion, with the spotlight. I shouldn't say target. I, I think Dion. I don't think he's done anything wrong. But, um, but the spotlight he has put on their program is, they're not going to get maybe a gift win or two during the season where no one, you know, someone just doesn't show up. Uh, I think everyone's going to show up to that game. It's going to make it even harder for them uh, to, to claw their way out of the, the basement of the conference. Um, USC is fascinating. Um, I, I tend to agree with you having them one. Um, I think, you know, it's fair to have them as the favorite. Love Caleb Williams. Lincoln Riley's tremendous, great offense. Are they going to stop anybody this year? That's the, the million dollar question. Um, for some reason, Lincoln Riley continues to, you know, hitch his wagon to Alex Grinch. I, I don't understand why. I, I think Alex Grinch must have like some dirt on Lincoln Riley or something. That's the only explanation I can come up with. Um, that being said, though, their defense actually does project better than FBS average, you know, for what that's worth now. Does that make you a title contender? I don't know. Ohio, Ohio State's defense last year was better than FBS average, but ultimately, you know, lost them the two biggest games of, of their season. So, I th- I think, you know, metrics aside, my gut tells me USC this year is going to look a lot like Ohio State last year. I think they're. I've got them as uh, projected as the number one offense, tied with Ohio State this year, both with a, a forty five offensive rating. So they're gonna they're gonna light it up offensively. I don't know that they're going to have the defense that's quite at the level that's going to allow them, you know, maybe they win the Pac-12, but I don't know that they're going to be good enough defensively to beat, you know, a, a Georgia or Ohio State or Michigan, teams that are a little bit more well-rounded this year. Uh, that, that's that's what I'm curious to see. And that's going to be interesting. I, look, Lincoln Riley's going to recruit more great quarterbacks in the future. He's already done that. Um, he's got, you know, Malachi Nelson. He's got – like the USC quarterback pipeline is, is just fine, but won't there be a part of certainly the USC fan base, but even a part of us and just nationally watching college football. That's like, boy, two years of Caleb Williams and no playoffs. I mean, won't that be considered a huge disappointment? If I'm a USC fan? Yes. Like that, that would, that would be hard to hard to stomach. Um, Caleb Williams is, is awesome deservedly won the Heisman is deservedly the, the favorite again this year. I I just wonder how far he can carry that defense. Uh, that, that's a huge burden to, to bear. So we'll, we'll see. Yeah. They, they, they kind of, to me, 
a lot of times when you make a coaching change, you're, you're taking a risk. I think the risk was sticking with Grinch this year because if the defense is the reason they don't make the playoff this year, you just wasted two years of Caleb Williams. And, yeah. only, and only because your defense couldn't stop anybody did you not make a playoff appearance. Um, I mean, your, your defense couldn't stop Tulane. No, no offense no. to Tulane, but, you know, Tulane's not Georgia or Ohio State or Michigan or Alabama. So, you know, you got to you got to improve. I mean, you know, they did go get Bear Alexander out of the out of the portal, which should help them in the trenches, which I think was a, a big weakness of theirs. But yes, I, I don't know. I from a schematic standpoint, even and, and I'm not a, an X's nose guru by by any means, but I've seen firsthand what Alex Grinch can do as a defensive coordinator. And it's not it's not championship level. No, I mean, he got basically run out of Columbus at Ohio State. Oklahoma fans were thrilled when Riley took him with him to LA. Uh, you know, this is, this would be three straight. And these are, these are amazing jobs. Ohio state, Oklahoma, USC. If you can't play good defense at those three programs, you can't play good. You, you don't know what you're doing. Yep. I mean, those are three of the best jobs in the country to be the defensive coordinator at. You just walk into any living room in America, you get p- kids attention uh, when you've got those three logos on your shirt. So the excuses are up there. And again, yeah, I mean, you have a bad year. They fire him after this year, but it's like, okay, but you, you just had Caleb Williams <laughs> and you, you let your, your defense prevent you from getting, and Caleb Williams is one of those guys like Deshaun Watson a few years ago, where don't even worry about if you're one seed, four seed, what just get in. Get Caleb in. Williams yep. is good enough to go nuts. Two games, two Saturdays in a row, or, you know, a Saturday and a Monday night in a row. And win you two games out of that maybe you shouldn't be favored to, or maybe you shouldn't win or maybe you weren't favored to win. And he's that good of a, of a player at that important of a position. So um, it's a big – man, this is going to be interesting, I think, to watch them. Um, you know, we, we talk about Washington. Uh, I think everyone thinks other than those two, Oregon and Utah, which you have two and three respectively here, are, are, are also contenders. I love Utah's program. They just uh, – Man, they're, they're, Whittingham's the best. Like he just, uh, just consistent. Like starting to recruit a little better too, which is, should be scary for everybody else. Um, I don't know, they got the experience back at, at, uh, at quarterback. They they've got. They always seem to to play with toughness. Um, you know, what do you see out of Utah this year? And and looks like you obviously you've got them third maybe closer to Washington at four than Oregon at two, if I'm reading that correctly. Yeah. So I, Utah's got a, about a 14 and a half, uh, 14.3 power rating. So they're, you know, two and a half points behind Oregon uh, about a half a point ahead of Washington. I'm with you. I, I love Kyle Whittingham. You know, they just seem to have USC's number a little bit um, kind of, kind of beat up on them. It honestly, this, this Utah USC, kind of dynamic really reminds me of Ohio state, Michigan a little bit, just in terms of the contrasting styles and, you know, styles make fights. And for whatever reason, like USC just can't get over the hump against those guys. Um, so I, I am very curious to see kind of how that plays out. I mean, their, their offense projects to be awesome, you know, a, a touchdown above FBS average defense, a touchdown above FBS average. So they're, they're going to be very well balanced as we've, you know, kind of come to expect from Utah cam risings back. You know, we'll, we'll see if he's ready for week one, you know, with the knee injury, but he is at least back at Utah this year. Um, they've got a tough opener, though, with with Florida, which is a team that I'm higher on, I think, than most. That line's opened at nine and a half. I think it's already down to seven, seven and a half. Wow. So, you know, some some Florida love there. Um, so we'll see, you know, if they can get through that. They they lost that in the swamp last year. So we'll see, you know, from a playoff perspective, it, they've got to win that. Obviously, if they lose, if they lose that first game to Florida, their playoff um, prospects kind of go out the window a little bit. But got them projected around eight and a half wins. I think, again, just like these other teams we mentioned, I, I think they absolutely could win the the Pac-12 again. I mean, they're the defending champs for a reason. So we'll see. We'll see if they can pull it off again. Yeah, I, I'm not not to beat the dead horse. I, I just love the top five or six in this conference this year. Um, you know, will they all beat each other up and go nine and three? That's very possible. And then, you know, kick the crap out of some good teams and bowl games and be like, Oh man, the PAC 12 is pretty good this year. I mean, that's, that's possibly how this could all play out for them. Um, Cause I don't, 
that there's so much to like here, but every team's got like one, like, eh, I don't know about this, you know, as far as, you know, calling them for a, a four team playoff or whatever. But uh, I, I love Utah's outlook again. Um, Oregon's the other team you got up there. Bo Nix, I think surprisingly came back. Um, yep. I think this, once you got out of those top few picks in the NFL draft, a quarterback, could Bo Nix have, snuck into a you know teams love quarterback it's like <laughs> snuck into the end of the first round or early second round i'm possibly uh, i would have drafted him over will levis that's for sure so um Same. you know kind of a, a surprising uh, good pleasant news for oregon they've got weapons um they they they're one of the few teams in the pac-12 although i think that's changing a little bit i think stylistically is changing a little bit, but they're, they're a team that historically has played defense too. Like they're not just a flashy West coast team. Yep. Um, they've generally been pretty physical. Um, so that's another team I like as a dark horse uh, playoff contender. Yeah. And, and again, like, like we've talked about with some of these other teams, the thing to keep in mind here with them, because so much of, of whether you make the playoff or not, isn't necessarily a, a direct reflection of how good your team is, but it's a combination of how good your team is and how easy your path is. And Oregon is, as far as these contenders go, they've got the easiest path in the Pac-12. Their strength of schedule is a 0.3, which means their average opponent power rating is 0.3. So they're basically playing an average team every week. Whereas USC's is two and a half, Utah's is four, and Washington's is five. So as far as the, the you know these top four teams in the Pac-12, Oregon by far has the easiest path. And obviously, that is something to consider when you're putting some money down on this stuff, whether it's win totals or or conference championships or anything like that. So that'll be a. Uh, and but the one thing that helps a lot of these teams again with the Pac-12, it's divisionless. So the the schedules are still very important. But if you can just get in that top two, or you're not like like I look at, like the Big Ten, for example, like the three best teams in the Big Ten are in the Big Ten East. So two of the three best teams in the conference are not going to play in the conference. So there is a little more wiggle room if you are truly one of the best two teams in the league where you're not going to get blocked out by being in USC's division or, you know, whatever it may be. So that's something to take in mind as well. Um, you know, you got Oregon State there is is really on that tier as well. You've got them right there with Washington and Utah as we look at this again. Um that was a team that uh, I want a little bit of money on late in the season because I, I that was one team that I don't think people caught up to. No, um, no. I think they got off to a really good they, – they were playing really good ball there, especially in the middle of the year, and I don't think people noticed. It kind of flew under the radar, and so they, they were uh, dogs there a few, di- a few times there in November. I was able to make some good money on them. Um, you've, you know, you've got them pretty high this year. It doesn't look like they're going to you know, fly under the radar this year. No, there, there's there's a lot of hype with them this year. And to your point about last year, people that have, have been you know watching, listening to our show, hopefully also made some money. Because if you recall, we one of my best bets that uh, rivalry week was Oregon State uh, plus, I think, the, the three and a half against Oregon. And they won outright as as dogs. So we, we were definitely on them last year, high on them again this year. Um, you know, the offense doesn't project to be great it is above average um but but well below you know these other contenders in the pac-12 however the defensive side of the ball projects to be quite a bit better than these other contenders so going to be a little bit more of a contrast of style here for oregon state although again you know with the transfer portal they bring in dj uyunglele they ran the ball extremely well last year i i could see this offensive rating ticking up so you know Honestly, the offensive rating was probably a little conservative on them. So if they can get it going offensively and just maintain kind of what I project here defensively, they they absolutely can make some noise. And I don't I don't know that I would pick them to win the conference, but I think they can ruin someone's day and make sure somebody else doesn't. No, they ruined Oregon's last year. Yeah, uh, exactly. The DJ situation is interesting to me. I think it's a talent upgrade for sure. Um and he probably fits with what they want to do offensively because he's, I mean, he's a big, strong, athletic kid. I mean, they can run a lot of QB power with with that running game they've got. Yep. Um, how bad of a look is it for Clemson if he like reemerges? Because that was one of the more disappointing development situations I've seen, and and really in the last, last 10, 20 years is is DJ coming in as a freshman, 
thrown for a billion yards, I believe, against what Notre Dame on the Notre road. Notre Dame, yeah. And uh, and then just just not much after that um, nope. to write home about. And so if they uh, if they can revive him, um, that's that's a big time wild card in that league, and probably not a very good look for Clemson and um, their offensive yeah. staff, but. We'll see how that goes. That'll be that'll be one of the big storylines to me is watching DJ this year. Um, you know, middle of the pack, Arizona, Arizona State, are they, you know, gosh, talk about two programs historically that have had good programs and and have just kind of been in the tank lately. Any reason to think they could surprise this year, or are they kind of stuck down there in the among the bottom handful of teams? I think I think for this year they're probably kind of stuck down there. Um, I do like the trajectory of Arizona though. Like I, I think that's a team in the next couple of years that can can maybe get it going a little bit. Uh, you know, maybe not. I don't, I don't know that I would predict them to compete for a Pac-12 title or anything like that. But I think they can be a much more respectable team going forward than they have been. You know, over the last handful of years for sure. And then Arizona State, I don't I don't really know what to make of them at, at this point. They've they've been kind of in flux here. You know, obviously getting rid of Herm Edwards and uh, Emory Jones transferring out, and it's they're kind of kind of in flux. I don't I don't have a great handle on them, admittedly, at this point. So uh, that that's probably a team that I, I'll have to be a little quicker to adjust their rating uh, once we kind of see what they're going to look like on the field. You now you said you wouldn't really peg Arizona as like a future Pac-12 title contender. What about a future Big 12 title title contender? <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, I'm I'm very curious to see how that unfolds and, and if they if Arizona does end up going to the Big Twelve, which has been rumored here this week, kind of what domino effect happens from that? Like, not that I am necessarily all that concerned about Arizona going to the Big Twelve in a vacuum, but what that might mean for the rest of the Pac-12, what that might mean for expansion for the for the Big Ten, SEC uh, potentially also. Yep, Pac-12 is kind of at the epicenter of the arms race right now, so see how that goes. Um, I think we've covered most of what we want to cover here, but UCLA, it's kind of like they're right in the middle. you got this top tier in the top left, got these five teams above them, got these six teams below them, and then there's UCLA kind of bridging that gap between the top half and the bottom half of the conference. Um, a bit of a revival last year. I think they sputtered a little bit uh, down the stretch, but uh, they were better than people thought they would be uh, last year. Um, some tough losses um, uh, personnel-wise to the NFL. How, how do you see the Bruins this year? Yeah, so they defensive-wise, they project right at average, which in the Pac-12 actually this year is one of the worst defenses in the in the league. But the offense projects to, to be really good. Um, you know, the, they're going to be starting a freshman at, at quarterback in Dante Moore. They've got um, Carson Steele, the the Mac transfer at, at running back, who's just a a beast. I mean, his yards after contact are just insane. The guy's an animal. Um, so I, I think offensively they can be really good. The question is going to be, you know, can they stop anybody? Uh, so I, I think they're pretty – pretty appropriately rated here kind of right in the middle. Like I don't really view them as a, a true contender, like these, these five teams ahead of them, but I also don't think they're going to be, you know, bottom dwellers like these other teams. I think they're pretty, pretty appropriately rated. Dante Moore is going to be a star. Um, I, I saw a lot of him in high school. I uh, got gradually better. One of those guys who got a lot of hype early, but then continued to improve, which is not always the case. Um, my final evaluation of him was in the all American bowl in San Antonio. And he was the best player there all week. And then was the best player in the game. Um, wow. He, he, he's a special, special player. And there was a lot of good players down there this year. I mean, Carnell Tate, we're going to hear, we're going to hear a lot about Carnell Tate and Brandon Ennis at Ohio state. We're going to hear a lot about Malachi Coleman at Nebraska. We're going to hear a lot about justice Haynes at Alabama, the running back. Dante Moore was the best player in San Antonio. He was absolutely spectacular. I hate riding true freshman quarterbacks as a rule, but uh, if there's a guy who can jump in and be special right away, I think Dante Moore is that type of guy. Um, And you'd love to see him in in a a Chip Kelly offense because that could be, that could be dynamic. Um, uh, He's, I mean, like you took, you take a look like what he did with like Marcus Mariota, Marcus Mariota, would give his left arm to have Dante Moore's right arm. Okay. Like 
the arm to, and I'm not saying Dante Moore is a guaranteed to be a top 10 NFL pick, but I'm telling you, he's more, a, he's much more talented arm talent than, than Marcus Mariota, who, who Chip Kelly made a star at, at Oregon. So that is certainly one of the big storylines for me is, is the passing of the torch from Caleb Williams to Dante Moore out in LA is going to be interesting. Then, then you're going to get him in the big 10 next year. Um, you know, going against Michigan and Ohio state and you know, those types of teams. And it's going to be really fun to watch him the next few years. He's a guy who could, who could absolutely be a top five NFL draft pick in three years. Wow. That you heard it here first. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's special. And, you know, to, to piggyback off of your point about true freshman quarterbacks, what can make that easier is playing a relatively easy schedule and UCLA plays uh, by, you know, by TSI's strength of schedule rating, the weakest schedule in the Pac-12. So it should be a nice, you know, uh, easy, not, you know, not, not easy because it's, it's still above average, but uh, much easier than some of these other teams have it as far as breaking in a, a, a true freshman quarterback. What's your projected win total for them? I've got UCLA at exactly eight wins. Hmm. I have not seen the Vegas over under on that. It is that correlate. It is eight, or I'm sorry, eight, eight and a half. So I, I've got Ooh, them. So actually I've going got, under. Yeah, I've got them a half game, half game, half under. game under. Okay. Well, that'll be interesting. That sound eight sounds about right to me. Um, nine seems steep even with the schedule, but if Dante Moore's, I mean, if he's Caleb Williams, I mean, Caleb Williams was, was very good, very quickly, uh, at yep. Oklahoma before transferring to USC. So maybe more can give him that. Um, but yeah, he's a, he's a real talent. Um, so again, you know, we joke about the PAC 12 kind of breaking up and you know, how, how lousy it might be moving forward or whatever, but like, I love this league this year. I absolutely love it. I think it's conservatively the third best league. There are things about it I like better than the Big Ten. I don't like it at the top as much as I like Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State at the top. But you take teams like four through six, four through seven. I like those teams better than the four through six, four through seven in the Big Ten. I, I think so. I think they're almost, I think they're similar. I don't think we're talking night and day between those two conferences. Um, I, I think there's gonna be some amazing, amazing games out in that conference this year. I can't wait to watch all of it. It's it's one of those leagues too where um, it's not just there aren't just good football teams. It's it's open. Like I, I don't feel like the Big Ten's open. I feel like it's Ohio State and Michigan with maybe Penn State trying to ruin it. But you already know the East is going to win the Big Ten title game almost certainly. Yep. Um, and you know what the score is in the SEC. You know it's gonna you know Georgia probably with maybe Alabama. And, you know, there's not much intrigue in some of these leagues. So there's not only good football in the Pac-12, there's real intrigue. I think there's like five, four, at least four, maybe five teams that could win this league. Yep, absolutely. I also am going to need a Monster Energy Drink sponsorship for this show to be able to stay up and watch Pac-12 after dark. <laughs> there we go. Let's try and make that happen. If anyone anyone out there with a connection, let us know. Um, but, uh, yep, we are uh, four-fifths of the way now through our conference previews. We will wrap up Power 5 with – uh, the ACC. And then we are going to do like a Notre Dame slash non power five talk uh, show at some point as well. But uh, this will do it for the PAC 12. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, you can follow us. Please subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already um, it's uh, youtube.com slash at CFB playbook. Um, and you can catch us on all your podcast platforms of choice as well. But uh, thanks for watching, listening. We will catch you soon. <laughs>